The Colored Orphanage Asylum, New York City, July 13th, 1863. 233 black children between the ages of 5 and 16, who only moments ago had been in classrooms, are now gathered in a single open space. Many of them are frightened and crying. They can hear the angry, racist mob outside, shouting obscenities as they brawl with the policemen shielding the building. The glow of torches light up the windows. Guided by caregivers, these children make their way to a back exit, but the building is surrounded and escape is not guaranteed. As they cut through the dining room, one of the girls cries out, The Bible! We forgot the Bible! A matron turns around. Finding her voice, she reaches for the child. Come along, sweetie. You can bring the Bible, but we must go now, okay? That Bible will be one of the only objects from this orphanage to survive the night. For New York is burning, and tomorrow this building will be nothing but a charred husk. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us history-loving beans well-fed fast. In July of 1863, New York City descended into a cauldron of anti-authority mob actions and racist violence. But to understand why that happened, we need to take a step back and look at the American Civil War as a whole. In 1861, most U.S. citizens thought the war would be over quickly, but those illusions were squashed after the opening battles inflicted nearly 120,000 casualties with no end in sight. This put both armies into crisis mode, especially when it came to recruitment, since after the initial patriotic push, volunteers dwindled. In 1862, with the war turning into a costly stalemate and both sides looking for a way to strike a decisive blow, both the United States and the rebel confederacy implemented military drafts. But unlike later American drafts, like the World Wars or Vietnam, the Civil War laws were explicitly written so that the privileged classes could avoid military service. In the Confederacy, anyone who owned more than 20 slaves was exempt from the draft, a provision that infuriated poor and middle-class Southerners. After all, the rebel states were waging a war to protect the institution of slavery, and yet plantation owners, you know, the people benefiting from slavery most, could just opt out of the fighting. Similarly, up north, the Union draft also had paths the rich could use to avoid serving, and they were just as blatant and despicable. A major difference was that in the North, if you were well-heeled and didn't want to fight, you could either pay $300 to the draft office or hire some poor soul to go to war in your place. In New York, the largest city in the Union, this was predictably unpopular with the city's poor and middle class, but it was especially galling to its large population of recently arrived immigrants. In the previous decades, a series of European crises ranging from the revolutions of 1848 to the Irish potato famine triggered a mass migration that delivered over 1.7 million immigrants to the port of New York. And among the most downtrodden of these European migrants were Irish Catholics. So when the federal government announced the Union Draft Lottery in the spring of 1863, the Irish and other immigrants who'd applied for citizenship were surprised to find themselves subject to it. Of course, few in the Irish working class could afford a $300 exemption. In fact, most of them barely cleared $2 a day while doing backbreaking work and living in overcrowded slums. Plus, as far as they were concerned, the Civil War really didn't have anything to do with them, so why should they have to risk their lives? Naturally, politicians like Democrat and Tammany Hall crony Fernando Wood decided to exploit this division and gain favor with the city's swelling immigrant population. As mayor, he pushed a pro-Confederacy agenda and opposed Republican abolitionists. Wood even went so far as to push for New York to secede from the Union, a motion that the city council quickly shot down. But these provocative moves were lucrative for Wood. At the time, the Democratic Party was pro-slavery, and those interests in the North were happy to finance Mayor Wood's political machine. And since New York's economy was largely dependent on cotton exports, Wood's pro-South rhetoric appealed to the city's working class and poor whites, whose industries had been squeezed by the war. This anger over the Union draft also heightened tensions between the Irish and New York's population of freed African Americans, who both competed for the same jobs. You see, many Irish perceived the war as being fought on behalf of slaves and the black community, but since African Americans weren't allowed citizenship, they also weren't eligible for the draft. From this, a recipe for disaster was born. Two marginalized communities caught in a whirlwind of racism and resentment as newspapers and local politicians worked the Irish immigrants and even some native-born citizens into a lather. Then these agitators got a new arrow in their quiver on January 1st, 1863, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation and New York Democrats began to use scare tactics, claiming an influx of freed African Americans would come north and take jobs from white people. 
And then came the first day of the draft proper, July 12th, 1863. Though that day passed without incident, with officials picking names out of a twirling lottery barrel. Granted, the crowd left the spectacle seething with anger. The ride itself would start during the second drawing on July 13th in front of the U.S. Provost Office on 3rd Ave and 47th Street. A gunshot rang out, signaling the raucous crowd that had gathered to attack the building. Rioters stormed the office, beat the employees, and set the building on fire. Mobs ambushed volunteer firemen as they attempted to stop the blaze, then cut telegraph wires to prevent police and property owners calling for help. The outnumbered New York Police Department tried to stop the violence. While a previous uprising, the Dead Rabbit Riots, which you can learn about in our Irish Potato Famine series here, had been put down in the past by a Union militia, currently those troops had been dispatched to Gettysburg. So as a result, the riots spread unchecked. The mob was not without purpose, however. As the rioters were mostly Irish Catholic, they purposely attacked and looted the homes of wealthy abolitionists, especially along Fifth Avenue. Police stations were besieged, Protestant charities like the Five Points Mission and abolitionist newspaper buildings, large and small, were targeted. Yet the newspaper offices put up a surprising fight. Despite being known for anti-Irish editorials, police managed to save the abolitionist newspaper The Tribune by attacking the mob from behind. Meanwhile, at the nearby New York Times building, the editor and staff actually scared off rioters by manning two, probably unloaded, Gatling guns, which may have been there for article research? I don't know. But as the riot continued, the focus shifted. Originally anti-draft and anti-abolitionist, it quickly descended into a race riot specifically targeting African Americans. In a blatant attempt to eliminate them as job competition, the mob sought out black dock workers to beat, stab, and lynch, and businesses that served black people were looted and burned. Among the destroyed was an establishment said to have been the first black-owned pharmacy in the United States. And finally, the Colored Orphan Asylum on Fifth Avenue, viewed as a symbol of white altruism towards African Americans, found itself under siege. While all 233 children escaped, thanks to police and staff, a few people were injured trying to stop the burning and looting. This included Fire Chief John Decker, whose repeated attempts to stop the attack infuriated the crowd. At one point, his firemen narrowly saved him from a lynching. This looting and violence went on for another two days, until, on January 16th, troops returned from the Battle of Gettysburg, mobilized, and engaged the rioters, killing a dozen of them by nightfall. Despite nearly 50 buildings destroyed and the modern equivalent of $100 million worth of property damage, the rioters went largely unpunished. Only 67 of them saw the inside of a courthouse, and none received significant jail time. Meanwhile, nearly 120 black people, mostly black men, lost their lives in the senseless violence, with the only real change being an eventual shift in the attitudes. After the war, the Irish and Germans, who had served in great numbers in the Union Army, found a modicum of acceptance in white America, in part due to men like Fernando Wood who found them a useful political constituency. Politicians continued to use race and economic arguments to pit these groups against African Americans who didn't reap the same rewards for military service. And of course, anti-immigrant sentiment found newer targets in the Chinese, Italian, and Jewish refugees. And as we look back at this history, it can't help but feel familiar, since to this day there are those that practice the politics of division and pitting groups against one another. Of course, one can only hope that by examining incidents like the 1863 riots, we not only begin to recognize these tactics for what they are, but also have a better understanding that whenever someone in power tells you to hate another stigmatized group, their goal is never to increase your power, rather the exact opposite. Once again, thank you so much to Factor for believing that important stories from history should continue to be told, though I imagine not on an empty stomach. Factor is my favorite ready-to-eat meal delivery service that's been sending me tasty meals each week for over a year now. Oh man, that's a while. So I don't ever have to worry about what's for dinner. Every meal is ready within two minutes with no prep, no mess, and no cleanup. Just really great food whenever I have time to eat it. It's really that simple. Each week, I just pick what looks the most delicious to me from their weekly rotating menu. And they have so many types of meals to choose from, you can be sure that everyone in your household is gonna get food that they love fast. Like this week, I devoured their honey maple BBQ beef with roasted potatoes 
potatoes, green beans, and cream corn. Yeah, that was tasty. Plus, with all the time I saved, I was actually able to boot up the PS5 and check out the new Cyberpunk expansion. Wait a minute, first Keanu and now Idris Elba? <laughs> oh, talk about breathtaking. You can give Factor a try for yourself with a great discount at Factor75.com or by clicking the link below and using the code ExtraCredits50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Once again, that is Factor75.com and the code ExtraCredits50 for 50% off fast, flavorful meals in your future while also supporting us making the shows you love. So click that link and feel good filling your belly. Did you hear the what about Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Michael Hoggett? They are all awesome legendary patrons.